focusing on your teen's mental health. And my name is Ruben Rakova. I'm the uh, Director of Medical Services for Pediatrust, and uh, I'll be the moderator for tonight's forum. Uh, joining us tonight, uh, we have several panelists. And when I introduce each of you, I'd like you to give a little wave so that we can put a face to a name. Uh, here to answer your questions tonight are Dr. Lori Hochberg from Pediatric Partners uh, with offices in Highland Park and Vernon Hills. Uh, Dr. Uh -huh. Josh, Dr. Josh Levin from uh, Elm Street Pediatrics in Winnetka. Thanks, Josh. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Maggie uh, Stephanie from uh, Pediatric Associates of Barrington with offices in Barrington and Crystal Lake. And Shauna Friedman, one of our psychologists from Primary Care Psychology Associates, the group who sees patients in both our pediatric partners' offices in Highland Park and Vernon Hills. And if I could ask everybody to mute themselves, except those of us who are on the forum, we're getting a lot of background noise from uh, the, from your calls. So it would be helpful if everybody could just mute themselves. Thanks. Uh, over the last two weeks, uh, parents have been sending in questions, um, and um, you also have the ability to send in questions tonight via the chat function on the Zoom call, if that's how you're watching us, or uh, through the Facebook Live feed. And we have staff uh, monitoring those questions. We will try to get to as many questions as we can, but we do respect your time. We want to keep this to the hour that we said, so uh, right around 7 o'clock we'll be wrapping up. Um, and we know that this is a topic that is relevant, it's important, it's on a lot of people's minds. Um, so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, thanks. All right, let's get to it. Our first question tonight, we got a lot of questions that got sent in over the last two weeks, all variations on uh, this one question, which crystallizes much of the main problem with this pandemic, and that is this. That teens have been expressing a lot of sadness um, over what they're missing, uh, a football game, homecoming, prom, sports participation, and other activities that are you know, very important to a teen's life. Um, it is very sad. Uh, Dr. Hochberg, how do we build resilience in our teenagers as they deal with these losses? Thanks for asking. Um, this is a very sad, stressful time it's hard for all of us to nag navigate so many losses, jobs, money, even the death of loved ones. While seemingly less important, teens have had to miss out on many fun life experiences. Also, some have had to deal with the loss of a job, an internship, even a first year of college. So how do we help them? First of all, listen and learn to your, for, from your teen. Don't assume that they feel the way you're feeling. Acknowledge and validate their feelings. Sympathize, but don't try to run to fix it. It's just stay connected with your teenager. In the long run, this negative experience will teach them resilience, the ability to cope with diversity. Diversity, sorry. In the long run, um, this will help them. These emerging adults need to learn to cope and adapt to stressful situations. Right now it's COVID, but it also could be relationships and breakups. It could be financial problems, money management. It could be learning how to get through a year of college or even find a first job. So teens need to meet these challenges head on and learn to overcome them. If not, they may develop poor coping mechanisms, which could lead them to alcohol or drugs. It's important to teach your teen to stay engaged. Don't flee from disappointment. Find positive pathways out of a tough situation. That right now they may feel like a victim. Help them to become a survivor and then a hero. Teens tend to be self-focused as many of us know. Teach them to look outside themselves and maybe help someone else that's less fortunate this might make them feel better about the current situation. There are many volunteer opportunities. They could pack, help pack food for the poor. They could work at a stocking shelves at a food pantry. Um, they could even help an elderly person who may not be able to drive and help them run errands in a safe way. 
They could also work with others to collect donations for the poor. One of our uh, partnership organizations called Cradles to Crayons is currently accepting volunteers to help stock their giving factory. Volunteering can give teens purpose and increase their self-worth. Help your teenager move toward goals. Teach your teenager to set reasonable goals and then move toward them one step at a time. Help your teen to focus on one good goal at a time, even if it's small, and then celebrate each one as it comes along. They will feel good with any new accomplishments. Also help them to nurture a positive self view. Help your teen remember the ways that he or she has handled hardships in the past and build on that. They've solved problems, they've made good decisions, compliment them on things they've done and assure them that they can do positive things in the future. Help them accept that change is part of life and that we have to replace new goals from our old goals that we might have thought were, you know, what we were hoping for. Also for yourselves, try to model self-care. It's very difficult right now, but everyone in the family should set time aside for family meals, healthy diet, exercise, good sleep, and just overall good self-care. Try to model resilience yourself and stay patient. It's important at this difficult time. It's exhausting to take care of yourself and your family. We all feel like victims right now, but we will survive. Stay connected with your teen and we'll all become heroes. Thanks, Laurie. That's uh, great advice. There's a lot uh, in there that you uh, gave. And uh, that reminds me, for those of you who may be joining you late or you may be distracted by other things going on at home, this entire forum will be recorded. And for those of you who've registered for it, we'll be sending out an email link later on uh, in the next several days uh, with a URL so that you can see the recording. So if you miss a part or you wanna go back and uh, hear what somebody said, uh, don't worry, you'll be able to uh, do that. Um, we'll also put the link, uh, I think on our website so that for those of you who didn't register uh, for it and are just joining us uh, either on uh, Facebook Live or some other way, then uh, you'll be able to uh, find the recording and view it uh, that way. Uh, all right, let's get on to the next question. We had several that were sent in about uh, reconnecting with friends after you know the shelter in place and, and being uh, away from friends. Uh, Josh, one parent wonders if her daughter is not connecting to her school friends is that normal? And how do we ease a teen's anxiety about reconnecting with friends now that restrictions uh, are being lifted? Yeah, um, good, good questions. And thanks to everyone for joining and, and listening to these important questions. Um, it's a very tough time socially for these kids. And I think for a long time, the focus that we all had was um, so intensely on the medical, um, let's protect people from getting sick. Let's not let them get hospitalized. And uh, the social and the um, emotional part kind of took a back seat for a little while. And now we're kind of seeing the pendulum shift a little bit where we're seeing some of the social and emotional ramifications for these kids. And uh, now it's time for us to really prioritize those and, and help them get back into the swing. So for a kid who we've said, you know, you can't see your friends and, oh, you can see your friends, but you have to wear a mask and you can't touch them and you have to be six feet away. I mean, it is normal for kids of all ages, four, five, 10, 12, 15, 18, to develop some, some hesitation and some anxiety through that. So I think we need to be um, reassuring to them that, um, you know, when we allow them to uh, re-socialize, that it is safe if they follow the recommended uh, directions that we give them. And um, we need to start letting them do that. You know, the only way that they're going to get over their fears of, of socializing and their hesitation is by letting them do it. So um, as with many anxiety things or things where people are nervous to do something, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. And so maybe it's, you know, maybe it's something you need to take gradually. Maybe first you just kind of have a hey, we're going to go chat on the driveway with your friend and you guys can sit in a chair six feet apart and just talk, you know, and you can wear masks if they're nervous about it. So you can ease them into it. And then maybe next they're taking a walk six feet apart and then they're, you know, going to um, have a bike ride or, you know, starting with outdoor activities that are that are shown to be safe 
um, and letting them ease into the socialization process is very important. And I think the other thing that's important with this um, is to recognize that if your kid is feeling anxious about being social or talking to their friends, that that's normal. Um, and we need to let them know that it's normal and that they're not alone in feeling that way. Uh, and we also need to let them know that we, you know, we will help them get through it and that they will get through it. Uh, thanks, Josh. I, the only thing I would add is, you know, as Lori had mentioned previously, modeling behavior is probably the, one of the best ways to teach your kids. So if your kids are anxious about reconnecting, uh, have a couple of your friends over for dinner, have outside on the patio, uh, practice social distancing, wear a mask if you need to. Um, and, um, you know, uh, modeling behavior like that goes a long way, certainly much more than just telling them what to do. But thanks, Josh, uh, for that advice. Um, it is a, a tightrope that we walk sometimes uh, between encouraging social interaction, but promoting social distancing. Uh, Maggie, how can parents do both of those things at the same time? Yeah, I think that is a challenge, especially working with this age group. You know, as Josh mentioned, there are definitely safe ways that we can help our teens to kind of get back into these social connections. But we do know that our teenagers tend to be a little bit black and white and sometimes have a tendency to go zero to 60. It's all or nothing. And so I think we need to know our teen a bit and know what our social situation looked like before and definitely help them to understand the reasons that we're recommending things like outdoor activities, social distancing, six feet apart, and help them to start small, you know, and to recognize sort of why we're trying to avoid big groups and educate them and involve them in the discussion. So I definitely think it's something that we can safely help them to do, but knowing our teens' social circumstances and their friend group will definitely help us customize that for each child. Uh, thank you. Um, right now, <clears throat> the plan is for most school districts to return uh, in late summer, fall, um, at least part-time or full-time with students. And we're hearing more and more school districts coming out with their plans over the last week or so. Uh, but this has caused a lot of anxiety, not only among teenagers, but among their parents and of course the educators involved. Uh, Shauna, what advice do you have for parents on how to minimize that anxiety in our teenagers and perhaps in ourselves as parents? Um, and are there any apps or other resources that parents can use uh, for anxiety either because of COVID or just because of anxiety in general in the teenage population? Right, right. Thank you. So yes, the school topic is very hot right now. And I think I've been hearing about it in every session all day, every day in the last few weeks. So definitely something on everyone's mind right now and really normal to feel that way. So first of all, you know, starting a new school year is anxiety provoking in itself, let alone during a, a global pandemic. So just kind of keep that in mind anyways, that your kid is always going to be a little bit more anxious during school. It's just magnified this year. So the Really, I encourage having open conversations with your teen about this. You know, talk about, okay, what, what are they anxious about? You share what you're anxious about. Really, I would encourage open conversations um, between you. So really validate and listen to their concerns. Kids, teens these days just want to be heard. They don't necessarily need solutions. They just want to know that you're listening and that you're really there for them if, you, if they need if they need to come to you with something. So really um, listen to their concerns, validate, encourage open conversations. And that's just not a conversation to have now. That's a conversation that's ongoing to have throughout the school year as well. If your district is offering a choice, whether that's e-learning in person, have your teen a part of that choice. That's gonna be really important for them. Teens wanna be involved in decision-making processes and often feel like they're not. So please get your teens input on if there is a choice, you know, what they want as well. If your child is deciding to go into school or that's what the district has decided, preview what it's gonna be like. Talk about, okay, this is what everything that your school is gonna be doing to keep you safe. Now let's talk about what individually you can do to keep yourself safe. So really previewing you that's Preview that for them so they can really understand um, and really know everything that's going on. You know, ahead of school, you know, a lot of kids have been, you know, isolated from their friends, just kind of like what some other people were saying earlier, let them see from a social distance some friends again, just so they can kind of get used to it. So it's not overwhelming the first day of school, try to get back into school routines, you know, a little bit before school starts, such as, you know, bedtimes and whatnot. 
Um, so in terms of some apps, you know, if you search in the app, there's a lot of things that, you know, can come out. The two, though, that are the most uh, popular and the people find the most benefit from are called the Calm app and the Headspace app. They're both free to download. There may be some in-app um, in purchases, but they're free. And what these both do, they're very similar to each other. They both have meditation on there, strategies for sleep, helping to encourage some healthy, good, deep breathing and how to do it properly, um, some various um, guided imagery as well. So they're both really good apps and I really recommend them highly. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, good resources. Um, as a reminder, for those of you on the Zoom call, there is the chat function. Uh, if you look down, put your cursor down towards the bottom, uh, you can ask a question if there's one that you really want asked that has not been uh, asked already. Um, so uh, that's a good advice uh, about how to deal with uh, the schools opening up. Um, a slightly older age group that some of you are dealing with are the college kids. Josh, one parent asked, if college courses will all be online, how can uh, the child go back to college? Dylan Davis. Uh, I'm sorry, should the daughter go back to college? Or just stay home for this semester. What, what advice do you have for that parent? Yeah, it's it's a good question and it's a fair question. And we're all we're all always a little bit anxious about sending our kids to college and with, with COVID lurking out there, I think even more so. Um, but I think we need to remember that going to college is not just about going to class. You know, it's about learning to be independent. It's about becoming more self-sufficient. Self -sufficient. It's about, um, you know, getting yourself on a schedule, being responsible, doing your laundry, getting your meals, getting your sleep in. So I think even if you aren't going to class um, directly and the classes are online, there's still a lot of benefits um, and things to learn through living on your own in a college situation. Um, we also know that, that socially, uh, even though there will be perhaps social distancing and perhaps mask requirements and it may not be the same social experience that, that we're used to seeing kids have in college. Um, the social experience is, is a key part of growth. And in a situation where your kid is at home, not meeting other people, not growing socially, not experiencing that, and then has to jump in late, um, they, they could potentially be at a disadvantage and we could be creating um, more social challenges uh, than, than we want to. So, I think um, apart from the academic piece, if we look at the social side of things and the um, learning independence and self-sufficiency side of things, there are a lot of benefits to being at college and um, the colleges are taking this very seriously. And I think have put together for the most part, good protocols in terms of trying to keep students safe. So um, I can't speak for every college, but the ones that I've been involved with looking at um, I think sending the kid to college to uh, learn all of those other things is really important. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh. Um, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, it, <clears throat> the next question is one that a parent sent in, uh, quote, this pandemic has brought up anxiety issues for myself. We both see our therapist via telehealth and talk openly about how doing so is helping with our issues. How can I help my team not to feed on my own anxiety, unquote? Maggie, can you address that question? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's definitely coming up a lot in our office right now. Um, as Shauna mentioned, I think it's really powerful for teenagers to get to understand some of the sadness and the losses that you know their parents are experiencing as well, just to sort of create some empathy and some understanding. I think where we sometimes run into trouble is where the communication from parents slips over into fear, that impending doom, the hopelessness, um, because I think it's important to remember that as little control as we as parents sometimes we feel we have in this situation, our teenagers have significantly less control, yet they are watching us experience our own stressors. So I think sharing in the experience, sharing sadness and those kinds of emotions is very important. But I think that when it comes to managing a more significant level of anxiety and stress, it's really important for parents to be using other outlets to communicate and process that. People like their friends and family and sparing their teenagers those, you know, those sentiments. 
Thank you um, for that. Um, all right. Uh, this next question came into us through uh, the Facebook live feed, and um, it's uh, a very good one. It was one that was not asked previously uh, over the last few weeks. So I'm going to send this one to Shauna, our therapist. Uh, the question is, finding a therapist can be a daunting task. What tips or suggestions do you have to pick someone for your child uh, to speak with? Shauna? That's a really good question, and you're right. It is hard. You know, you Google's, you know, a psychologist or social worker, and there's so many choices. A good place to start, honestly, is your pediatrician. They know your, your, they know your teen, and they can give some good recommendations based on what they know about your teen and what they know about who's in the community. And when you're at, when you're at an appointment with a psychologist or a social worker or any kind of therapist, you know, it has to be a good fit. Us psychologists, we don't take offense if you're not interested in us or, you know, you want to go someone else because it really has to be a good fit in order for the therapy to really work. I'm not the best fit for everyone. I'm a great fit for a lot of people, but not the best for everyone. And I'll admit that. And so I, it really, you got to find someone who is going to be the best for your child. So always start with your pediatrician. You can always talk with um, other friends as well and see who they have um, been to as well. Uh, thanks, that's good advice. You know, I might wanna add here that uh, the group that Shauna represents, PCPA has six pediatric therapists that, are, uh, that see patients at several of our sites, including Elm Street, uh, Wheaton Pediatrics, and uh, both offices uh, through Peds Partners. And then uh, Maggie's office, Pediatric Associates of Barrington also has a couple of therapists uh, from uh, Dirksen that sees patients in their offices. And uh, Shauna's group PCPA can also see patients from any Pediatrust office uh, via virtual visits. So if you think your child's uh, got some issues that need a, a therapist's help, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, I think that the best way to do that is to uh, call the phone number 847 6860090 or contact your local Pediatrust office and ask about uh, those services. Um, and that information will also be um, uh, sent out when we send out the link for the recording tonight. Um, all right, thanks again, uh, Shauna, for that. Um, let's switch topics slightly here for just a second um, and get to a general question. Um, uh, there have been some questions coming in about these symptoms or issues uh, related to COVID, but these are common issues and symptoms in any teenager's life at any time. And that is, how do you differentiate between normal teen moodiness and actual depression? Um, Lori, how do you answer that question? So it's a tough one, and a lot of parents are very concerned at this point. I mean, a lot of people are very moody. Uh, it's kind of funny when you ask a parent of a teenager if their child is moody they always kind of laugh and you know say yeah my you know teenager goes in their room and shuts the door and I don't see them for three or four hours and I think they're on their phone I'm not sure they might be playing games you know sometimes they come out to get food but that but that's about it so how do you know when it could be a serious problem and not just being a teenager who's trying to exert their independence set up their own lives themselves and away from their parents. Um, some teenagers may appear sad and withdrawn when they're with you and then you see them with their friends and they look a lot happier. So how can we determine what is true depression? So there are very set guidelines um, that you need to have several of in order to meet the diagnosis of depression. One is a change in mood most of the day, every day. Now, this can be somebody who's feeling sad, hopeless, easily frustrated, very irritable. Any of those changes in mood that you see for most of the day, um, almost every day, that would be a concern. There may be a decrease in interest in things that they previously enjoyed or an inability to have fun, to find something pleasurable in their normal activities, their hobbies, their sports. You know, we always get concerned when an athlete quits his team, you know, what is going on? Um, there may be a change in appetite, usually a decrease, and it may be associated with some weight loss. Often there's poor sleep quality. Um, this usually shows up as early morning wakening, um, as opposed to 
Patients that are anxious tend to have trouble falling asleep. This is early morning and even middle of the night, um, frequent awakenings. So they are always feeling very fatigued and very tired. They may have trouble focusing. They may say, my brain just doesn't work and um, have trouble making decisions, things they normally could do in the past. Now that you know, my, seemingly minor issues set them off. Um, they may appear incredibly agitated, even pacing back and forth, or they may look incredibly slow and sluggish. Um, they often express um, feelings of worthlessness or even guilt that they're just not good enough to be part of your family, to be part of their friend groups, they blame themselves for things, um, that kind of negative um, self-worth. Um, they often avoid social interactions, which is what we've been talking about. Um, and um, overall, they, what we refer to this is sadness without a cause. So if you say to your teenager, why are you sad? And they're like, I just don't know. That is a, that's a warning sign. Um, some people um, may develop some somatic or body symptoms that are concerning. Um, they may feel like they're trouble swallowing, a lump in their throat, which is why they're not eating as well. They may develop some tension headaches, dizziness, chest pain, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, um, everything that were kind of that are kind of warning signs for COVID right now, which is distressing, but also may be very um, um, anxiety producing for your teenager. So if they do say they're feeling something that isn't right, talk to your doctor, validate their feeling and get them checked out just to make sure nothing is seriously wrong. There's another diagnosis right now, given the times, um, that we call demoralization. And this is a chronic unhappiness due to an adverse circumstance, kind of like months of being in quarantine. Um, it could also be from something like the death of George Floyd, which made people up to distress with the social inequality in our society. All of these things can cause um, anyone to feel kind of demoralized. It may make people feel unmotivated, helpless in making any change, um, they tend to avoid coping and don't learn to adapt to a crisis. So they just give up. Um, unfortunately, these emerging adults then fail to, to transition to adulthood and we need to help them um, make that transition. They often feel socially isolated and they're the only ones that feel this way is what they think. But really, obviously we know that many people are feeling the same. So try to stay connected with your child. Again, validate their feelings. You know, um, it's okay to, to mourn the loss of an expectation like a prom or engage or you know graduation party. But then let's try to make some changes. Let's try to make it a little bit better. Um, get help your teen get back on a schedule. A lot of teenagers are feeling kind of hopeless because they have nothing to do. So you know, encourage them to get up in the morning. You know make time to exercise, make time to eat healthy, make time to see a friend socially that isn't, you know, too close and, um, you know, shower, get dressed, take good care of yourself. Um, maybe they can take a summer class online or get a job babysitting for that neighbor that needs to work at home and kids are going crazy. Uh, many of large companies in the area are hiring teenagers to help out with home deliveries. Um, again, they can volunteer. Um, and they can get on a good routine. Uh, model a positive outlook on life. Try yourself not to focus on this negative um, situation that we're in right now and try to find some positives in the world around us. One thing that's really important, and it is a scary um, thing to think about, but make sure you're, you're checking your child for any signs of self-injury or even suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts. This is a um, kind of a daunting task, but it's important to talk with your child about it because they may be embarrassed that they feel better hurting themselves or that they're thinking about these things. It won't make your child start to do that. You're not giving them the idea that they should be doing these things, but it's really important that you check and you monitor for it. And obviously if you do um, have any concerns, reach out to your physician about that. Um, most importantly, just listen, be available, and be supportive. 
thanks, Lori. Uh, that's all very good advice. And you know, I think uh, if parents aren't used to it, they often think of depression as just being sad and kids moping around all day. But as Lori pointed out, lots of different ways that it can express itself and show itself um, from a behavior, mood, uh, emotions, uh, and even physical complaints. So be on the lookout for all of those. And obviously, as she mentioned, if you have any concerns, uh, contact your pediatrician uh, about that. So depression, uh, uh, obviously a big concern among teens and their parents. The other diagnosis that we see a lot of, and we've been mentioned multiple times now tonight, is anxiety. Um, Josh, what can you tell parents out there about the signs to look for if their uh, child is anxious and what signs or symptoms would be a sign that that anxiety is great enough that it needs to be addressed either psychologically with a therapist or even sometimes medically uh, with a physician? Good question. Um, and one that's obviously very important right now because I think everybody is feeling more anxious than they used to, um, or at least a lot of people are. And that goes for, for everyone, little kids, big kids, teenagers, adults. Um, our lives have been disrupted. Our routines are uh, not what they used to be. We are not finding our lives as predictable as we like them to be. And that creates um, a sense of chaos and a sense of unrest and can lead to anxiety for people. And so whether we call it anxiety or worrying or nervousness or, or whatever, um, this is something that is very real and we're, we're really seeing a lot of. So I think we need to be uh, first and foremost, recognizing how common it is right now and how, how um, important it is to be aware of it and looking for it as parents. So when we're seeing signs in our kids that things aren't quite right, um, we should be thinking in our heads, I wonder if maybe they're anxious. I wonder if that could explain why they're angry, why they're irritable, why they're lashing out, why they're sad, or why they're withdrawing, why they don't want to go outside the house, why they don't want to go place play, uh, um, you know, catch with their friend from social distance. So um, I think I think the symptoms can be many, um, anything from withdrawing to being overly anxious to being angry to being irritable, sort of similar to depression, how um, when you're not feeling quite right mentally, they can show up in a lot of different ways. But if we are keeping the anxiety possibility on the radar and aware of it, then then that's the first step. And then I think the second step is if we are perceiving or, or even wondering if our kids are feeling overly anxious or more anxious than to engage with them, you know, talk to them about it, talk to them that if they are feeling nervous, anxious, worried that that is okay um, and, and that it is common and that it is normal, but that um, it's important to talk about it and to seek help. And so as other people have talked about before, um, normalize these things, validate your kids' feelings and then seek help, whether it be from um, your your pediatrician or a therapist you may have or or friends you know that have been through the same thing. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Josh. Now, um, um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Hochberg. You had mentioned previously about sleep issues, um, both for anxiety and depression. There's different issues, but sleep seems to be very disturbed. If we know how important it is for teenagers to get sleep, and most teenagers, even if they aren't depressed or anxious, have a hard time getting enough sleep. What advice do you have for parents about trying to get their teens to sleep a little bit better and a little bit longer? Right. It's really a big problem that we've been noticing um, since the quarantine. Um, it, sleep is so important for every part of your body, whether you, you can't, you know, it helps you think, um, it helps your appetite. It helps all your body processes. If you're not sleeping, your stomach tends to hurt. You tend to get headaches. So it's a very important for people to get good sleep and at the right time of day. Because a lot of teenagers are staying up all night, sleeping all day, and they're missing key daylight hours. And daylight does help mood. And um, it helps you kind of function in the world at large instead of staying in your room on your computer all night. So it's something that we're really stressing with a lot of teenagers is get back to good sleep habits. Um, as I've told many parents, this is not a five month vacation. 
Um, many parents are feeling sad and guilty that their kids are missing out on previously scheduled camp experiences, travel vacations. So they're kind of overindulging them and say, oh, I'm just going to let them sleep. They have nothing to do anyway. This is not really a healthy um, uh, way to go about it. So it's important to encourage your teenager to get up in the morning, start the day, again, um, eat healthy meals and get to a schedule. Um, one other few ways to kind of get back to a good schedule, and I've been warning people that they are going back to school soon, whether it's online or in person or both, and they are gonna need to start getting up in the morning. You can't just cold turkey, if you're going to bed at 3 a.m., yeah, going, you know, start going to bed at 10. So one of the methods is to have your teenager start going to bed 15 minutes earlier every night and then get them up in the morning, 15 or at afternoon as the case may be, 15 minutes earlier. And each day just keep setting the clock back until they get to a regular bedtime, you know, 10, 10.30. Um, ways to help them get to sleep are obviously to turn off their screens. It's recommended to turn off all screens, including phones, iPads, computers, uh, one to two hours before you try to go to sleep. That light from the screen really stimulates the brain and keeps them awake. Often people find that it's really helpful to put their phones in the kitchen, just plug them in somewhere else, get them out of the bedrooms. A lot of teenagers are texting, chatting all night, and it, they never then fall into a deep sleep and so they're kind of chronically fatigued because they're not getting into getting their normal stages of sleep. There are some homeopathic me methods to help sleep. Um, lavender, whether it's a spray or a diffuser in the room is helpful. Um, keeping the room very cold and then um, putting on a weighted blanket or a fan to blow and help that helps some people feel sleep as um, feel sleepy. As Shauna said, there are some apps that are helpful. The Calm app um, has some good meditation on it as well as some really soothing sounds. And all of these things can help, help people sleep. Um, one thing we kind of forget about is caffeine. Really avoiding caffeine anytime after lunch is really important, even in the form of chocolate. Um, obviously Coca-Cola, teas, things like that. Um, make sure everything is, is caffeine free as possible. Um, and then encourage at least 60 minutes of vigorous exercise every day. Many of us have been staying in the house. We're not walking anywhere. We're not walking to classes. We're not out with friends. So there really is a lack of exercise that we, our bodies aren't used to. So getting some more exercise. Um, if you take um, chronic medications, make sure you're taking those medications on um, an appropriate, at appropriate times. Um, one thing that I didn't bring up in the, in the last question was um, antidepressants. Those often help people relax and get to sleep. They are safe if your doctor or your psychiatrist recommends them. And um, take it at different times of the day. Some people find they sleep better if they take their pills in the morning. Some people find they do better if they take their pills in the evening. So work with your doctor, ask questions. Um, don't just assume that you know, you're doing it exactly the way um, it's, it's best recommended. And um, certainly if you have questions about any medicine that anybody recommends, um, please um, ask that question. Uh, one more thing I, I almost forgot to mention, uh, melatonin is a natural, um, kind of like a vitamin that does help people start to get back to sleep. We use it sometimes even for jet lag. Um, something, a small dose like three milligrams about an hour or two before bed does help some people fall asleep. And it is in general a safe thing to use. Certainly check with your doctor if, if there'd be a problem for you taking that, but that's one more helpful hint. Uh, thanks, Lori. You, you did mention antidepressants and uh, a question came in on the chat um, are antidepressants safe? I know you said, sure, they're safe. But for a little further explanation, uh, Maggie, um, can you uh, tell us what you know about antidepressants? I know none of us here are psychiatrists, but many of us do prescribe them. Um, and what can you tell that parent about the safety of antidepressants? Sure. You know, I, I would agree with everything that Lori said, that, you know, when antidepressants are prescribed by a physician and are closely monitored by a physician, especially as we are 
you know, in, initiating increasing doses or decreasing doses, you know, they can be a very safe option, especially during this quarantine when we've had kids who did have some preceding level of depression or anxiety in the past, and this has just been an additional stressor. Those have been kids who have especially needed some of that support during this time. We always recommend that medications would be given as part of a treatment protocol that would involve counseling as well, because again, it's just one piece of the puzzle. But generally, antidepressant medications are safe and well tolerated, especially if we are closely supervising that. Uh, thank you um, for that answer. Um, Shauna, we got another question that came in uh, by the chat uh, regarding teenagers who are rebelling by not wearing masks, they're not social distancing, they may be sneaking out to be with their friends. Uh, some of that uh, obviously. Um, associated sometimes with anger issues. Uh, how do parents deal with the anger and the rebellious behavior brought on by the COVID restrictions? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we know in general, teens are prone to anger, prone to rebellion. It's just gonna be amplified during this time. Uh, so, you know, the first thing is, you know, I've heard from a lot of parents, you know, oh, I feel so kind of like what Lori was saying earlier, I feel so bad for my teen, you know, they're missing out on this and this, I'm just going to let certain things go. You know, you can be a little flexible here and there, but overall, you want to continue to set the limits and boundaries that you usually have in place, as well as the consequences and following through with them. Just, you know, this isn't like, you know, what was said earlier, like a five month vacation, you know, this is still life. And those still, those things still need to be followed really consistently. You know, when it comes to specifically with, you know, following COVID restrictions, have open conversations with your teens, really talk to them about the importance of it and really reinforce that. And if they can't follow that, then maybe there needs to be certain limits to their socializing outside the house. And, you know, again, open conversations about really about anything I've said this um, before, it's just so important with your teen. You want to be able to foster an environment where they want to come to you with this, with these things. So good communication is really, really important. No, there are, uh, right now there's a, a lot of, you know, teens are either, either really alone or with, with family, you know, neither side of that is, is great. You want to have a balance. So you don't want to be, have your teen be alone all the time. That's not good for them. It can also, you know, um, increase anger. You don't want them with you all the time because everyone needs a break from each other. So really finding that balance. One important thing to keep in mind is anger often is, is expressed by teens, but there's stuff underneath it that's really going on, such as depression and anxiety. So keep that in mind when you're looking at your teen's anger and then as a result, their rebellion based on that anger, really think what could be going on underneath that and look out for warning signs. So, you know, if you're some of the things that were mentioned earlier, you know, increased irritability, you know, um, increased isolation, not as much interest in things they used to be interested in, increased anxiety, checking in on different risk factors um, such as self-harm or suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation, check in on those. because So just really when you're thinking about the anger, think about what, what is underneath the anger as well. And encourage your teen to find healthy outlets for their expression of anger. So it's okay for your teen to be angry. We're all angry to some degree right now. It's more, it's not about having that feeling, it's about what you do with that feeling. So finding a different outlet to express that, such as exercise, a lot of people find that is a really good outlet to express themselves. So really encourage your teen to find what that is for them, whether that, and then another good one is painting or drawing. That's another really good way to let out that anger. Focus on what's going well too. When we're angry, you know, we're all in the house together, we focus on what's bad. Focus on what's going well as well. So if your teen, point out to your teen the things that they're doing good. So thank you so much for taking out the trash or great job wearing your mask all day. Focus on the positive and not just the negative because the more you focus on the positive, that will be reinforced. This is really hard for a lot of parents, but stay as calm as you can when you're angry at your teen. Teens model what they see. If you're really elevated, they're gonna get really elevated. I know it's hard not to yell. So, but it's more effective for you to be firm 
and calm in whatever message you're trying to deliver than you screaming and yelling at your team. So really keep that in mind. Check your own behavior. No one's perfect at it. You're not going to be able to do that all the time. But as much as you can, really think about how you're approaching these situations in your tone because your team's going to base their reaction off of that. Uh, thank you, Ashana, for that. It reminds me of the advice I used to give parents uh, with toddlers is you got to catch them being good. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes rare, but you got to do it. Uh, all right. You know, um, there's obviously a lot of pessimistic news coverage about COVID over the last few weeks with the rise in cases and fatalities as states have reopened up. Um, it seems very, very pessimistic if you turn on the news nowadays. Um, Maggie, what can you tell parents about what is an appropriate amount for teens uh, regarding the news coverage? Uh, what's the appropriate content? Um, how do we restrict some of that or limit some of that when they're you know, walking around 24 seven with access to you know, uh, news all the time? Right, that's a great question. You know, I think for most of us, whether it's adults or teenagers, I think right now, this is something that we could all sort of get lost in. And it is, it's very negative, it's very pessimistic. And we're really working hard to try and keep them on the other side of that optimistic, hopeful. So I have really encouraged the families in my practice to try and step away from that input as much as possible. Um, I think from a parent standpoint, you know, I think a we want to be informed about what vehicle our kids are using to get this information. Um, also considering if you're going to have a period of time and you look at it, maybe looking at it together. So you could also propose some information and sort of debrief together when you're reading some of this data. Um, one of the things that I tell my families at work, you know, who have a hard time stepping away from it is that my interpretation of all of this information is that it is helpful if it's trying to help us to modify our behavior. So early on when we were trying to get people to buy into social distancing and the importance of that, you know, this news media coverage was helpful to send that message and get people to comply with the recommendations. If somebody is already complying with the recommendations, they are respecting the situation and what needs to be done, there isn't a lot to be gained from filling our, you know, our days with sort of depressing news coverage. And so I think the more we can educate the kids and their parents about that, we can all kind of step back and you know look for highlights, look for major changes and things like that, but leave sort of the day-to-day -day details to somebody else. Thank you um, uh, for that answer. Um, uh, Shauna, a, a parent wrote in worried uh, about um, a teenager who never has friends over. Uh, when asked, the teen responds that he interacts with his friends all the time. It's just mostly online. Um, is that normal for teens now? So it actually is normal. You know, it's very different than when most of us were growing up, but it, it, it is the norm. You know, typically, um, if we're just looking at the different genders, um, and I'm gonna talk a little stereotypically here, um, but males are communicating with each other more via um, games, video games, like Fortnite, for instance. You know, I talk to teens, oh, who have you talked to? Who have you hung out with? Oh, I talk to my friends every day. Oh, really, what do you do? Oh, we're just playing Fortnite. So that's the way that they're, their friends are communicating right now, well, especially during this, but even not during a pandemic. So it's more common that we think, of course, we want to encourage, you know, in person hanging out. We know that's better for development, but this is kind of the norm right now where girls are more likely to want to see each other in person or during quarantine, they're going to want to talk not necessarily on the phone, but they want to FaceTime, they want to see each other, they want to have more discussion. So it, that's just some of the differences right now. So I would say, yes, it is normal, but please encourage your teen to see their friends outside the screens, see them in person and, you know, finding that, that balance between them. Thanks. Um, Josh, there's um, a question came in uh, tonight. Uh, there's a lot of parents stressing about sending their kids to college. You answered a little bit about the college question earlier. The parents suggested we form a support group. Any thoughts about that? Many parents are worried that these kids when they go back to school are obviously not gonna follow any rules. Um, what would you say to that parent? Yeah, 
Um, good questions. I, I think, as we talked about before, sending your kid to college is always scary and even more so now with COVID going around. Um, letting our kids go to college and let them make their own decisions and good choices and bad choices is, is always hard but it, it's something that is sort of a rite of passage. It's something that we need to let them do. I think support groups in general are great um, to share ideas with other people and bounce them off. People who are having similar experiences to you uh, may have good advice, may just be a shoulder to cry on, so to speak, um, can empathize with each other. So I think those are really good ways to share ideas. Um, and. Uh, I don't know that, in my opinion, the COVID uh, college question is, I mean, it's obviously medically different than the issues that we typically talk about with going to college, but in some ways it's not any different than all the other high-risk teen behaviors we talk about, you know, drinking alcohol, vaping, um, using marijuana, uh, practicing safe sex. All of these things are things that we worry a lot about and we, we talk a lot with each other about and we hopefully talk to our kids about. Um, and give them the best tools that we can to allow them to make good choices. So I think as with any of those things, it's just important that we um, engage our kids before they go to college and talk to them about these things and why they're important and, and give them the um, best knowledge base that we can in order to enable them to hopefully make good decisions. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, you know, I, I think if, any parent who has a child who goes off to college, regardless of whether there's a COVID pandemic or not, is a little anxious about all of those things that you mentioned. Um, but if you think back, whatever, 30 years ago when it was you going through college, um, you know, that independence, that learning to make decisions on your own, learning to uh, from your mistakes, you know, it's an integral part of growing up. So that's just one more thing we've got to go through as parents. Um, uh, one other question uh, I'd like to get to because it came in tonight and is basically um, on a lot of people's minds now. Um, we talked earlier about uh, the anxiety about going to school, but we didn't address specifically the medical realities of getting all of those kids back in one classroom or one large school like a high school. Um, and the question came in, given what we keep reading about things that may increase the risk of getting the coronavirus, like indoor spaces, old ventilation systems, length of time when it's exposed, realistically, how safe is it to have kids in school? I know that is a very hard question to answer, Lori, but I'm going to send that to you. Um, what sorts of, I'm sure you're getting this question every day in the office now that kids are coming in for their school physicals. What reassurances do you give parents, or just what advice do you give them knowing what we know and knowing that this is an evolving situation? Right, right. It is, um, you know, I feel like every day there's new information that we receive. It's very hard as uh, parents and as, as doctors for us to, um, to come to consensus all the time. At this point, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics is strongly recommending that uh, kids go to school. It's very important. It's important for socialization. It's important for, especially for education. And it's important for parents because they have to work as well. So we know that e-learning is in general, not nearly as uh, helpful for kids as in-person learning. We know specifically studies have shown that math and science classes are really taught much better if they're in person than if they're online. So at this point, it appears that um, we think that most schools are going to offer, offer some hybrid version of um, some online and some in-person school in order to then follow the guidelines set up by the CDC, set up by the Illinois Department of Public Health, set up by DCFS to have safe spaces for our kids to go to school. So some of the, I know some of the schools are looking at smaller class sizes, uh, having kids go alternate days to school so that they can sit six feet apart from each other, head to head wearing a mask. It's gonna be required that all kids wear masks to school, which seems really difficult, but most of them are getting used to it. Definitely having your, 
your teenager practice using certain masks that they feel more comfortable with. You know, two or three ply masks are really helpful at preventing your child from spreading disease and from catching disease. So we know that that's really a very helpful thing that people can do. You're also going to remind your teenager to wash their hands frequently. They can carry hand sanitizer that used to be not on their shelves, but now it's back on the shelves. So if they touch frequently touch surfaces like their desk, like the handle to the door, they could spray their hands or put a little hand sanitizer on their hands and really avoid touching their mouths, which should be covered by a mask. Certainly for lunchtime, they're going to need to wash their hands or use a hand sanitizer. And we're hoping that lunchtime when the masks are off, that there is enough space for them to sit safely or even outside, even better, away from people so that they maintain some good social distancing. Um, while some of the schools may be pretty old, there are some ways that they can um, do very deep cleaning. And that is part of the IDPH recommendation is to have time where the schools will deep clean every evening, maybe every few days, do an even deeper clean. So that is in the guidelines for the schools. Some of them may um, open the windows. I know the old, older school in our area is now getting um, ventilation system slash air conditioner units into each of the classrooms in order to improve that. So I think some of the schools are already looking into some of these ways that they can make it safer. There may be some staggered class time so that there's less kids in the hallways at one time and not so many kids kind of grouped up together. There may be a cohort of groups of kids where they go from class to class to class together so that there is a less of a contact with other kids, which is not so great for multiple types of socialization. They'll have to do that on the phone, but at least they're socializing a little bit and they're staying within a contained group. Uh, most likely the drinking fountains will be shut down. People won't be drinking from water or putting, you know, potentially having their mouth near something that might be contaminated. Um, really important to remember this fall, more than even in past years, is, is getting your child vaccinated against influenza. That is going to be really important because we don't want any co-infections. Um, if, if you're knocked out by influenza, then may put you at more risk to catching another virus like COVID. So make sure that you put that kind of on your list of things to do this fall is to get your child vaccinated against the flu. The other thing is to remind your teenager, if they're not feeling well, they should stay home. So not all teenagers, in fact, most teenagers don't get very sick from COVID, thank goodness. Not even, some of them don't have any symptoms at all. So if your if you're teenager, is like, oh, I'm just exhausted. I just don't feel so good. Have them stay home. They can learn online that day. Schools are going to be really um, good about excusing absences if somebody isn't feeling well, as long as they do log on, um, hopefully to an adequate e-learning experience. So um, hopefully these things will help everybody feel more comfortable. But um, in general, it is important for um, kids to attend school. Uh, right. If I could add just one thing to that, I know some districts, people are, uh, or districts are making uh, some adjustments. Um, I've heard of uh, uh, one school or a couple of schools where they have ultraviolet lights uh, overhead now. It won't be turned on when the kids are in school, but, you know, the other, whatever, 16 hours of the day uh, to try and kill any uh, COVID germs and other germs. Uh, HEPA filters have also been suggested in some schools, I've heard. So there's different ways to uh, try and get the virus out of uh, the environment uh, as much as possible. So we're uh, already up to seven o'clock. I want to take that last question as a reminder and a plug for our next question session, which tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, August 5th, which is uh, going to be all about back to school. So um, if you have more questions, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some more, um, Hopefully some of that information will be a little bit more clear. Uh, there'll be a, a few more details that we can give you, um, but obviously it's a, a big stressor. So be sure to either uh, sign in and register for that session or view the recording after we do it. Uh, so we'd like to respect everybody's time. It's already a little after seven. I wanna thank everybody who joined us tonight. I wanna thank our panelists um, and our behind the scenes help that you all can see. Uh, Anjali and Lizzie, who've been helping us tonight with uh, the Zoom call and the Facebook live feed. Thank you. Um, 
again, our next session will be in August about back to school. Um, and I hope everybody stays safe and has a good uh, weekend. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.